EP Magazine presents Layla Tamimi and her uplifting story. From suffering a debilitating perilous and stroke to graduating this past January with honors from Montclair State University. In addition, we focus on vision, hearing, speech, and how these impact the development and education of people with special needs. Read it today at www.epmagazine.com. Oscar Mike Radio is a proud podcast partner of Reads Across America Radio. Heard every Thursday at 11 a.m. and Sunday at 8 a.m. Eastern. They're also big supporters of the nonprofit I Got Your Six, Two Lives at Once. And with every wreath you sponsor through Oscar Mike Radio, $5 goes back to this great organization dedicated to making a difference in the lives of veterans, law enforcement, firefighters, and first responders battling PTSD. Two Lives at Once pairs these brave men and women together with dogs rescued from kill shelters. In this way, two lives are saved at the same time by saving each other. Donate now. Go to wreathsacrossamerica.org slash Oscar Mike Radio to help. That's wreathsacrossamerica.org slash Oscar Mike Radio. Suicide is preventable, and each of us has a role to play in suicide prevention. Suicide is complex. There is no single cause, and it's not always a mental health issue. It could be loss of a job or home, financial or relationship issues, pain, or leaving the military. Suicide does not discriminate. It affects all ages, races, and genders, veterans or not. If you know a veteran who is struggling, connect with them. Let them know help is available. There is quick and easy access to services in times of crisis. Dial 988, then press 1. Talking about it is okay. Don't keep it inside. Don't be ashamed. Don't wait. Reach out. Find resources at va.gov slash reach.
Oscar Mike Radio. My name is Travis, Marine Corps veteran and your host. Oscar Mike Radio is part of the Hoobazoo Network. You can find out more on hoobazoo.com. I want to thank my sponsors, Joyce Asak of Asak Real Estate, Army National Guard veteran Mark Holmes of Reaper's Italian Power Washing, and my supporters, Caisson Shaving Company, Exceptional Parent Magazine, and Black Cat Designs. I love conversations. I love the way we can talk with each other and share stories. Today is no exception. I love it when, um, you know, Don and Anna from Core PR reach out to me with one of their artists. I've talked to several of them before, and today is another treat for you. Uh, Army veteran, accomplished Nashville recording artist and radio artist, I am pleased to introduce Army veteran John Michael Ferrari on Oscar Mike Radio. John, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. Yay. Two veterans. <laughs> two, two, two veterans, uh, one with a silky smooth voice. That's you, John. Ah. And, and and quite a story, quite a story. And, you know, what I'd like to do is just start off with, you know, who who's John in? How did you get started um, in life and music? And we'll talk about your military career next. But introduce us to who you are, please, sir. Well, I was a young kid living in San Francisco on California Polk Street, <laughs> if anybody's familiar where that's at. And um, I remember one day uh, I asked my stepdad if I could have a guitar. And we went down to Market Street, south of Market Street, there was a little pawn shop. And uh, we went in there and we picked out a guitar for me. And I took it home. I didn't know how to play it. Didn't even know how to hold it. And I was trying to figure out this way or this way or this way. And I thought, ah, I'll look at a picture of Elvis. And however he's holding it, that's how I'm going to hold it. And Because I'm left-handed, but I held it right-handed. And that's how I learned how to play Wait it, right-handed. Yeah, because in your videos, you're holding it right-handed. Yeah, I'm left-handed, but I play it right-handed. All right, so just <laughs> military question real quick. Do you shoot left-handed or right-handed in the, in the Army? Did you... I shoot with my right hand. Okay, that's write, that's wild. I write well. I write left-handed, but I had to in order to write on the blackboard because left-handed write people write like this. Right, I can't go to the blackboard and write like that. I had to learn how to write right-handed on the blackboard with my right hand. Fantastic. So I write left like this, right-handed on the right board, blackboard. <laughs> But you picked so it up. Now I can write with either hand. I could either whatever hand I pick up with, that's the hand I'll write with. And you, so you can, you can play probably right and left handed. So that's I don't know if I can play the opposite way. That, that's a little bit weird. Yeah. But I throw a ball right handed. The only thing I do is I eat left handed and write left handed. But everything else is right handed. That's truly amazing. I mean, because I, I play the piano and I'm messing around with the bass right now, and I cannot imagine trying to play it left-handed yeah. I, I just couldn't do it 
<laughs> so you, you got started off, you got the guitar as a kid and, and you, you watched Elvis and started playing. Yeah. Well, I, once I saw the way, right way to hold it, I immediately started to pick out chords and Tom Dooley was the first song I ever learned how to play. Dun, 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 dun. And uh, it was just gradual. I just started uh, learning chords. I remember going to Sears and Roebuck and getting a, a, a chord book. And my first best chord that I liked was a C major seven for some, I hit that and I go, oh, that sounds so nice. You know, just, uh, that was my first real chord to learn how to play C major seven. So you just, did you practice on your own and just pick it up on your own with no like teacher or, or, or lessons? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, I just played it on my own, and and uh, but you know, at the time when I got the guitar, I wasn't completely enthralled with the guitar. I mean, I played it, I liked it. At that time, at that age, I was involved in skating at the uh, ice skating and roller skating. So I was really spending eight to ten hours a day, twelve hours a day at the rink, practicing all the time. And then I'd come home and plunk on the guitar a little bit. But I was really into skating in competition at that at that age. So that's where I kind of learned discipline about once you start doing something, you do it for you do it over and over again. Roller skating at the at the Sutro's ice skating rink in San Francisco, or skate land at the beach in San Francisco. Man, that's anybody's awesome. familiar with that. <laughs> so you're growing up and you're going through life, and you have a very interesting backstory there, where you know home life was tough, and then you you kind of you know move past that. And then you joined the, well, did you get drafted into the army or did you join the army? I wasn't really clear on that. Well, here's the thing. When I was living in San Francisco, I, I went to school until I was in the eighth grade. And I lived in the East uh, Bay, uh, Walnut Creek, Concord for a year. And then and when I went to the ninth grade, I moved up to Reno, Reno, uh, Nevada. And I kind of got in trouble a lot. So I became... Uh, I had to go to court one day in uh, uh, juvenile court, and the judge said you were incorrigible. Well, I didn't ever heard of the word incorrigible. I thought he was giving me a compliment, and I said thank you, Your Honor. And he said you're pretty smart, <laughs> whatever guy. And he made me a ward of the state. Sent me. I wasn't bad enough to go to reform school, but they sent me to the Nevada State Children's Home, which was a nice place to be, actually. And I spent a few years at the Nevada State Children's Home. And then at the age, almost 18, I was released. And I was sitting at the Golden Nugget with my friend, Charlie. And we were both in the same predicament. You know, we were in, in, kind of in school, out of school. And we're sitting at the Golden Nugget. And he says, you know what? We should join the military because if we don't, we're going to end up in jail. And I said, I think you're right. So I said, what do we do? He said, well, let's go down to the Selective Service Office. It's right down the street and sign up. I said, okay. So we left the Golden Nugget and went down to the Selective Service Office and said, I want to be drafted. And I said, I'm 17, but I'll be 18 in a few months. And they said, sign here. And when I turned 18, two weeks later, uh, I was drafted into the military. Just, just, just like that? Yeah. <laughs> just like that. And then uh, I went to Re I went to Oakland, California, and and for my physical and everything. And we stood on a long line, and uh, the sergeant walked down and says, "You're in the Navy. You're in the Navy. You're in the Marines, and you're in the Army." Just like that. And that's how I got into the Army because you know they were drafting all the services. You know, you could have been drafted into the Marines, could have been drafted into the Navy. It was whatever their call was, you yeah. know. And I would be standing in a spot where. I went into the army, which was fine. I, I wanted to go into the Navy, but the army was fine. All my relatives were in the military. So I really wanted to be in the military. On my grandmother's mantle, there was all of our relatives in the military outfit. When I was a little boy, I, I, want, I thought, I want to be on that mantle as a, a military person too. So I was inspired by my cousins and everything who had already served in the military that I wanted to do that as well. What was the Vietnam experience like? The reason I ask, you know, 
those who I know who have served in Vietnam is, you, you know, you, you watch some movies and think that's how it was. And they're like, that's only just a sliver of what your it was actually like. Um, so, you know, if you can, you know, what, what was that time like for you? Well, you know, when you go through training, they really brainwash you. <laughs> they brainwash you in, in the sense that they make you believe when I went to jump school, they make you believe that if your parachute didn't open and you hit the ground, the first thing you do is jump up and yell airborne. In reality, if you hit the ground, your parachute doesn't open, you're dead. But you believe that you, you're that tough. You believe that you're invincible, that you can actually go into combat and survive it. Uh, and they put that belief in you. And they train you over and over again to, to, uh, to, uh, in combat techniques. They always say, we don't train you to fight, we train you to kill. And that's what they do. Uh, so by the time you get to Vietnam, you're, you're running on autopilot. You're running with everything that they trained you to do. It's like, you don't have to think twice, you just do it. But when you're in combat, it's total confusion, total confusion because it is so loud. You have, uh, the, with the artillery going off, the jets coming in, people yelling, people screaming. You know, it's not like the uh, uh, movies that say, okay, everybody, we're gonna advance. You can't hear anything. So you're, you're going off of just what you've been trained to do. If somebody gives you a hand signal or something like that, you just do it because it is total confusion. And that was the first thing that I realized when you're in combat, that it is very confusing, uh, especially in Vietnam, because you didn't always see the enemy. You only heard where the shots were coming from. You thought you heard where it was coming from. You think it maybe it's on your flank, but you could be on the other direction. It's really deceiving because the echo, and you can hear the, you can feel the wind of the bullets as they pass by your ear. If you just take that go like that with your ear, that's how that's how close Get the out. bullet will right so by that, your that ear. That bullet's you like a, eight inches from your ear, sick or closer. Well, it goes right by. You can feel the the, the 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 bullets pass you. The heat you never realize the heat that it it encumbers when those bullets are flying through the air and it goes and misses your head. You can feel the heat and you feel the wind. Go. But you know you're trained and you just think you just keep going on. If you weren't trained that way, you would fall to pieces. And that was where I got my inspiration for my first song, Dust Off, because it was taken from an incident on my first operation of getting into Vietnam. Okay. Uh, we went to base camp and they shipped us right into the jungle. And the very next day, we were in combat. And I remember all day long we were in combat. That night, we had a reprieve for a while. Everything slowed down. Uh, and then at night, it all picked up again. Uh, all, the combat for, all through the night. Uh, and I remember during that night, looking up and seeing the helicopter. It's called the dust off. It comes in, it picks up the wounded or the, and the dead. And I saw that helicopter coming in. And there's a red light that shines at the bottom. You go tch, 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 red, and you can see that. Well, they're not supposed to come in during combat, you know, they, but you know, they're there to, to give you support and help you. And, and they would come in and, and they try to get all the wounded people out and get them to medevac, uh, get them back to base camp so they could somehow save their lives. But they'd come in under fire, even though they weren't supposed to, but they did. And that was called the dust off. And when I, Got back to base camp, I think about a couple of weeks later, I wrote about that incident, you know, and that's the song Dust Off. Got a bullet in my side and it hurts so bad, but you know I can't die because my girl would be sad. 20 more days and Jody be taking my place. Well, if you're not in the military, you wouldn't know what Jody means. But well, we, I don't yeah, know Joe, Joe, Jody, you know who Jody is? The guy back home with your girl. <laughs> yeah, I, I met Jody too. How about that? Yeah. Jody's everywhere. Yes. Come on, NCO, got to get on the ball. Tell the RTO to put in a call. Those are all military terms, but, you know, I wrote it that way, and, and I didn't write it for any other reason just to write it, but 
uh, I sang it for a couple of uh, for a couple of guys, and the officers heard it, and then they uh, asked me to come to the officers' club and sing it, and that was a big hit. And of course, then I would, uh, you know, just do a little show with that song and some of the other songs I knew how to play, and and about a, a, a week and a half of doing that. You know, I, I felt guilty that I was not going out with the rest of the guys on combat missions. And I asked to be relieved from playing the officers clubs to go back to my unit. I asked, I, I just, I need to go back to my unit because I can't do this. I, I, there was this sense of guilt that every, all the other guys were going out to the field and I was being in this nice safe environment and I didn't want to be there like that. So they put me back out there, and that's where I wanted to be. How long did you serve in Vietnam, John? A year, 11 months and 22 days, I think it was, something like that. And what was and it like? They, they sent me to uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, as a, uh, an instructor. And I was there only until a couple of months, and I got out of the military. But they offered me E5 and $5,000 if I would have stayed in. See, now I, I, I got out. I should have stayed in. I would have still had that $5,000. Know? <laughs> Sometimes you can't put a price tag on being like done. I, I get it. So I, you... but, you know, I was a young man and I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. And, you know, I got out of the military and all I did was get in trouble. And, and you know, and out of... All the regrets I have, and very few, very few, I, I just think, looking back, I thought, if somebody would have spoke, talked with me, if I would have had a mentor, they would have said, John, stay in the military. You don't have anything else going for you right now. And, you know, stay there for four more years and, and just put your time in. You know, I, I could have done that. I should have done that. But because the next few years, all I did was get in trouble. It was, you know, with the law, and I was just... <laughs> Or kind of a rowdy kid, but so, I. So, but, but how do you go from being a, a a sergeant, you know, corporal sergeant lawbreaker to getting into actually, you know, starting to find your music, you know, because you've been doing this a long time, John. I have, you know, I used to play in, in high school. I, I played in uh, bands and things, um, and when I got out of the military, that that was the only thing I, I thought I knew how to do at the time. And there were clubs, there were steakhouses, there were everywhere you go, uh, every restaurant had entertainment. And I would go there and um, ask for a job and I'd audition and they'd always hire me. And I'd sit in the corner, you know, and I'd play all the Jim Croce songs and Cat Stevens songs and all these different songs uh, that were popular at the time. And I made a small living. I think I was making about 30, 40 bucks a night. But, you know, that wasn't bad because my rent was only about $75 a month, you know, so I was doing okay, you know. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, back then, there were so many venues that had entertainment that a person could learn their craft. You could learn it, you could learn a repertoire of songs, and you could develop your skills and get paid for it. They don't have that now for anybody. But back then, it was available to all of us that knew how to play and sing all these different songs. And it was a nice way to make a living. And I enjoyed that. When did you start writing your own songs? Because, you know, a lot of musicians like yourself start off playing cover songs or other people's songs, but some of them develop more into their own style. When, when did you start to really find, you know, who John, you know, Michael Ferrari was as a, as a, as a songwriter performer? Well, I wrote songs when I was in high school. Okay. I never thought of me as a writer. And then when I got out of the military, I wrote some songs uh, also, but I had no idea on how to get from where I was to recording. You know, I was living in uh, up in Walnut Creek area, Concord area. I, I should have been living in LA or Nashville because then I would have... Uh, been introduced in, in that atmosphere because that's where everything was happening. I was born in LA, but I didn't really grow up there. I, although I did come back later on. I did how to make that transition. So even though I wrote songs, I um, 
I did the cover songs because those were the ones that were paying. You know, anytime you do your own songs, you really don't get paid for it. But when you do third party songs, you get paid for it. But if you stick with writing your own songs, there's a big payoff there. Okay. And it wasn't until years later that when I met Pepper J, uh, that she made that transition for me. She said, we're going to take your songs and we're going to give you a different career because I was really doing cover songs, but I was at the top of my game for being an unknown. I was getting paid really well to do shows, uh, concerts, uh, dinner houses. Uh, I would come out and sing cover songs. I'd do anything from Tom Jones to Al Jolson to whatever was popular uh, you know, at that time in, in the music uh, genre of uh, popular songs. I knew how to play them all. So I could go anywhere and entertain people and get paid for it. But I was getting paid uh, very well. I'll tell you a story. One night I, I was playing in Las Vegas. I was playing the casino there. And I think it was the Continental. It was on Paradise Road at the time. And my friend came in and I'm up on stage and I'm singing, I'm dancing, I'm moving around and doing the whole thing. And then I, I, I said, okay, everybody, I'm going to take a break and I'll be right back. And my friend's sitting at the table. And, uh, and I walk over to where he's at and, he, and he's got this strange look on his face. And he goes, John, what are you doing? I go, what do you mean? He says, you're putting on this big show and there's nobody here. It's like three o'clock in the morning. I'm playing in the lounge. Three o'clock. And, and he said, why are you doing that? He said, you're only getting $75 a night like I am. And I told him, I said, if I give them a $75 show, that's all I ever get. I want to make $1,000 a night. And, and if I, I will try to put on that kind of show. And it wasn't long after that, years, a few years later, that I started making that kind of money. But, but when you start making that kind of money, that's about as high as you can get as uh, doing cover songs. But it was good. It was a good living. You know, it was nice living. But it wasn't until my agent in Las Vegas, uh, Steve Sheldon, I don't think he's with us any longer, but he was a very well-known agent. He said, John, I'm not going to book you anymore. I go, what? <laughs> he says, you got to get out of Las Vegas. He said, you're not going to have a career here. If you want to have a career, go anywhere else, but not Las Vegas. You come to Las Vegas after you've made it. You don't come here to make it. Okay. And, you know, there were a lot of us performing in clubs that were uh, just doing cover songs. But he liked me and he was giving me good advice. He said, do what you do and people will find you. Find, but you have to find yourself. What is it that you do? Cover songs aren't really, you know, aren't going to get you anywhere. So he said, but I'm going to book you one more time. I'm going to book you outside of Palm Springs. There's a little club called Highland Springs. It's a resort. Very similar to, remember Dirty Dancing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a resort like that. Okay. He said, I'm going to book you there for the summer. They're going to take care of you. You're going to, have, you're going to live in the cottage. Uh, they have a lot of things going on. And you're going to be in the lounge. They have a main showroom and they have a lounge. You're going to be in the lounge. And, and uh, he said, so... You know, so he sent me there and and um, actually he sent me about uh, uh, three and a half weeks before the season started. So when I got there, uh, I, I met, uh, I forget who was the property manager of the, the grounds and they were informed that I was coming. So they were going to, uh, they had a cottage ready for me. They said, there's nobody here except the ground keepers because the season hasn't started yet. He said, but I'm going to take you to the kitchen. You go in there and you make your food and things like that. You're going to have the whole place to yourself, you know, for three and a half weeks. And it was a, quite an experience. And then the season started and, and it was like busy. It's just like you saw in the movie, Dirty Dancing. And that's where I met Pepper J. Uh, I met her and uh, I was playing the lounge. I was playing the lounge with uh, my partner, Michelle. Okay. Now, Michelle... Is a, it was a mannequin. That's somebody that the bartender was going to get rid of. So she was inviting me over, her and her husband invited me over for dinner one night, and there was a mannequin in the corner. I said, what are you doing with that mannequin? She said, I'm going to throw it out. I said, no, let me have it. 
I want to take the mannequin. She said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I have an idea. I said, do you have any clothes for the mannequin? She, she gave, yeah, I have a red dress. So she gave me the red dress and I put it on the mannequin. So what I did is I put my keyboard up and I put the mannequin behind the keyboard. So like she's like that sitting on the keyboard and I was standing on the stage playing my guitar. And in between the songs, I would talk to the mannequin. I, I called her Michelle. And people just thought that was hilarious. And some people didn't catch on that it was a mannequin for the longest time. Hey, go, hey, Michelle, how you doing? We got a good crowd tonight. Hey, hey what do you want to play? Let's play some songs here. And I, that's what I would do. I just kind of, so it was funny, you know. She fell apart after a while. <laughs> but uh, one you know, night- you, know, you, you have a little bit of a comedic flair in you, John. Did you ever <laughs> use comedy in your shows? Because you're funny, man. I don't know. Well, I, I when I'm doing shows, I I ad lib a lot of stuff. You know, yeah. and there are some routines in there that I have. You know, I put in there. But you know, the most in, in, important thing is that you entertain the audience. You don't just sing. You know, and I, and I kind of learned that after all these years playing in little clubs. You talk to the people because you know it's more important what you not just the songs, but you communicate with the people. You talk with them. You interact with them, and they remember you. Yeah, and, and you just try to be yourself. And if it sounds, if you think you're going to say something funny, don't say it because it don't it doesn't come out funny, you know. And I've I've learned that, you know, because I, I'm talking, I'm saying it, something pops in my head like, oh, this is going to be funny, and I'll say it, and it's like bombs, you know. You got to be spontaneous. You just got to just go with it. Whatever comes to your, it just happens right there at that moment. You just say it, and it's usually funny it works out pretty well but pepper came in one night and uh i think i sang lady in red to her and she was in the audience and uh and i um walked over and i think i danced i grabbed her and i danced with her and i sang to her on the dance floor where i'm holding the microphone and doing lady in red now let me preface that you're probably thinking well how can you sing lady in red if you're playing the guitar and you're not playing the guitar right at that moment I started learning, this was back in the 80s, late 80s. Um, I started working with MIDI. You're familiar with MIDI? Yeah, the MIDI interfaces, yeah. Yeah, back in the 80s. I started programming my oh. music. So I had songs, uh, maybe about 25 songs programmed that I did. So when I wasn't playing guitar, I would play them on my computer. I'd bring in my little computer and I would play the songs on a Commodore 64. And that's how I could play, I could interact. You were a Commodore with guy? Yeah, well, at that time, you know, the Commodore 64, it was pretty popular, you know, at that well, time. instant so cred, man. I used to play with my friends on that computer. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I programmed some of the songs so I could actually put down the guitar and 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 interact with the people. But I was singing Lady in Red and, and uh, she said, you know what, you're pretty good, but I can make you better. I said, oh really? Now, 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 let me stop you right there. When you had to have heard that several times, why did you believe Pepper and, and not other people? Because nobody ever said that to me. And nobody ever- Oh really? Everybody thought I, I was good and, and, and I was good you know, making a living at it. But I, I didn't have that transition. I never made that transition other than I was a guitar player, but I didn't know how to really be on stage as a performer. There's a big difference between singing and being a, a performer, an entertainer and performer. I didn't know how to make that transition. And she grew up in the business because uh, when she was a kid, uh, her best fr uh, friend was... Uh, her grandmother's best friend was Sophie Tucker. I, I don't know if you know who Sophie Tucker is. Sounds familiar. So, well, Sophie Tucker used to be part of the Rat Pack. She would be singing with Sinatra and, and, and all those people. So Pepper grew up in the atmosphere of uh, the Rat Pack of Sinatra and being involved in, in, in all that stuff. And she knew what performers would, how to be make performers, you know, because she was grew up in that. So she kind of took me under and 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 taught me 
how to make that transition from being just a, a musician into being a, an entertainer and performer on stage. And and at some point she said, you know, you, you need to write your own songs. And I, I thought, well, I have songs, but uh, I don't know, I, they were they were okay. And, but anyways, I didn't have the confidence back then, you know, not doing my own songs. But years, a few years later, uh, I started recording my songs. And a few years after that, uh, when I started, I got, discontented with playing clubs all the time. I really wanted to quit. I said, I'm done. I'm done with the music. And uh, so I'll, I'll do photography. So I did photography for a few years and I became very good at that. And uh, it was a nice little business. But I started writing songs again. And when I started writing songs, uh, she said, we'll go to Nashville and record these songs. And I said, okay. And that was the big change in my career right there. Because once you start doing your own material, you're in a whole different arena in the music industry. You know, because everybody starts off as a band. The Beatles started off as a cover band. The Eagles started off as a cover band. You know, all the major bands started off as cover bands. Then they started writing their songs. Well, that was my transition. I started off playing music in a band and cover songs like that but it wasn't until i started recording my own songs that i felt the transition all of a sudden i'm in a different uh area of, of my career it, an area i've never been before because now i'm viewed differently i'm viewed as a different kind of artist and when we went to nashville and recorded our first songs we thought we're going to take their advice I knew how to write in, in format structure, radio structure, a, a thing called radio structure. If you don't write in radio structure, you're not going to get radio play. You may get some, but you won't get much. But I knew how to make that transition. I knew how to write in a good structure. And when we got to the studio, uh, our session leader said, John, he says, you have an extra verse here. It takes you out of the radio structure. You got to lose the verse or you can keep it. And you, you make that choice. I love that verse, but we took it out. As it turned out, that song was number two, you know, on the national charts. Well, you know, once that happened, I, I had a whole different career. And then the next song came out, and that hit the charts. And the next song came out, and I got on the charts. I mean, all of a sudden, you're 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 doing things in a different uh, part of life I've never experienced before because now I'm not just a cover artist. I'm actually an artist that uh, writes and and does my own songs, you know, like James Taylor. I could have, if I would have started back then, then I would have been with all those guys, <laughs> you know, I guess. Right. But I didn't have a mentor. And that's why today I try to mentor young people and give them the opportunity and the guidance. Pepper and I both do that together that they might have a career faster in, in than what I had, because I just kind of lingered. I had no idea. And if it wasn't for Pepper, I wouldn't even be where I am today because she made all this happen. Now, but just, you need- Just out of curiosity, I mean, you've been with Pepper for a while. So your success has been because of your relationship with someone like her. Whereas it seems like some artists will bounce around from you know, producer, manager, so on and so forth. You know, was it important for you to stay with Pepper? Well, yeah, because, you know, we're opposites, complete opposites, you know, but that's what makes it work. And and she's, uh, her education and, and uh, uh, her knowledge of, of how to do things is out of my uh, uh, platform because I, you know, she does all the business. And, yeah. and that's what artists need. They need somebody who can, who can do all the business. And I can do some of it, but I, not what she does. But she doesn't do what I do, being an artist and writing songs and arranging. But she's there uh, to listen to what I'm doing, and she has a good ear for things. Uh, so we're just a, a good partnership. We've been together over 30-some years. Wow. So, uh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Stop, 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 stop. Time out, time out. 
you've been together yeah. professionally longer than the average marriage, John, is like what, six and a half years now at best. Oh, it, yeah. So so yeah, I we, mean, there's there's some real like synergy going on between you two professionally to work like that. Yeah, we work well together. I mean, we're yeah. we're together every day. <laughs> you know, we have a relationship, you know. Nice. Uh, you know, and uh you know, it, it's a it's a good relationship, you know. Uh we we just it was uh, meant to be, I guess, you know, who knows. But it, as far as my career, you know, it, it's it's good because I mean, she's had the education, she's been a teacher, she's been a lawyer. Uh, oh, wow. she she knows things. Um, you know, she handles the contracts. She does the bookings. I mean, at one point, she gave up being a lawyer to to do our music. You know, That's she incredible. said, you know, "I want to do what you do because you have fun. I don't like going to the office every day." <laughs> well, let me let me ask you a question then that I ask all artists. Um, you know, everybody gets asked the same question here on Oscar Mike Radio, and you know, there's no no favorites done here, but it's it's it, we'll see. We have a lot of fun with this. So you have been in business for a very long time, right? You, you've been doing this at a very high level. You're award winning, and you know, there comes a point in time where some artists, like you know Paul McCartney and Neil Young, where someone like Sony will say, Hey, we'll buy, or Michael Jackson, we'll buy your entire song catalog and they sell it and kind of retire. So my question died, and I just asked this, you know, earlier today to somebody else, you know, if, if you got, or I have a check right now for $300 million, that's what Neil Young got offered for his catalog. But if you take the check, John, you're done performing in public. You can never perform in public ever again. You're done doing that, but you have the money. Would you take the money? Probably not. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because we're already situated really well, you well, know, good. so uh, we wouldn't need to do that, you know, but uh, $301 million, yes. $300 million, no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I haven't heard that before. Usually, it's it's a no, like you know, like this is this is who I am. This is what I do. I don't I don't care if I'm singing to one person or a million. I I, I love the aspect of creating music. But why would you take a million and not three hundred? No, but what I'm saying is, is that uh, I mean, if you needed the money, yeah, you you would take it, you know. But yeah. we don't need the money. I mean, it, it's we don't have that much money. But you know, but you know, we live comfortably, we're, you know, and we do what we do. But see, if you sell your catalog, that doesn't preclude you from performing live. You can still perform live. I mean, and you still have the recognition of all the songs, so you can live still live off of those songs because you have a reputation of going to out in public and singing those songs and getting paid for it. So you can still make a, a, a good uh, living, just even if you sold your catalog completely, you can still go out and sell, uh, do performances, get paid. Okay. Well, just, it's just it's just a kind of a lighthearted question that you know gets people thinking. And uh, I've had a lot of artists, no artist has ever said yes. Doesn't matter, no artist has ever said yes. And you keep that streak going. Um, you know, one of the things that I see, you know, I'm, I'm on your website and I'll have the link to the to your website and Oscar Mike Radio Show Post. The website is johnmichaelferrari.com. And again, folks, I'll have that and there's other links in the Oscar Mike Radio website post. But one of the things is, is you do keep this, you know, every, every now and then you do have like a, like a Love America song or a patriotic song. And then, you know, you give, you know, honor to those who've served in the, in, in the military so that kind of gets me curious about, you know, I, I'm listening to uh, Soldier's Prayer. And I was really interested in that because learning about it, you really had a very specific reason why you wrote that and wanted it to sound the way it did. And I was hoping you'd tell us a story behind that song, please. Well, Pepper likes certain songs. Okay. 
And I think the last time we were going to Nashville, she said, oh, by the way, I, I think I need another song to fulfill this uh, slot because it's a, she has a, what do you call it? Gospel. Gospel uh, songs, inspirational songs. And I've written uh, four of them, I guess, and she needed one more uh, to complete it, a set, so that we could uh, promote that. And I said, well, I, I don't know, what, what would I write? And I don't know, I think I had wrote something. The thing is with that particular song, I only had a few uh, hooks in there, but I wrote down a lot of lyrics. And, you know, Pepper was actually more uh, uh, credited for putting it together because she took the lyrics I had and used those. I, she really, so I'll use this one and this one and this one. And she put pieced it together and she said, but I need a chorus, uh, give me a chorus. And uh, then I wrote that chorus that uh, whatever it, it is, uh, which, how's it go? Pride and Grace. Pride and Grace, yeah. Soldier's Grace. And as it turned out, I, uh, it was strange because it's a, it's a song about the view of a dead soldier. Yeah. You know, it, it, dead soldiers talking. And where I got that idea from was a different sources, but you know, in the song I see, I, I, I sing about, I've seen the pain on a soldier's face and both sides say, bring me home safely. And I was referring to, no matter who the enemy is that you're fighting, both sides want to come home. Yeah. You know, they have their families, we have our families. I've seen when we captured Viet Cong in, in combat, and when we captured them and we rounded them up, I could see the fear in their eyes as, as it would, we, we would have the fear in our eyes if we were captured by the Viet Cong. You know, and they have their families and they want to go home. And you know, I've seen that on both sides. And that's what the song is kind of like, both sides say, bring me home safely. We have our families. And this soldier didn't make it back home but he was he was married and he has a new bride but for the for 60 years he watched over her his wife until the day that she would die and join him again and i got that concept from an old movie called uh, mrs the ghost and mrs muir have you ever seen that i've not seen that no okay so it's about an old sea captain okay. that lives in a in, in a house and he's he's dead now but he he lives there as a ghost in the house and anytime people try to come into the house he scares them off except for this one lady she she falls in love with the house and he tries to scare her off and he it doesn't work with her and she confronts him she said i'm not going anywhere <laughs> you know i'm living here and you don't you're dead and you don't belong here anymore and so they have a, a, a rocky relationship, but over the years, they develop a, a, a love for each other. And at some point he decides that he has to leave because he can't have this affection for a human that's alive and he's a ghost, but he watches over her and he leaves her. And as she years go on, she gets older and older until one day she's an older person sitting in a chair, rocking chair, and and she she's uh, ready to die, and he starts to appear, you know, and uh, and as she fades off into a sleep and dies, he he comes and he takes her hand, and she becomes a young woman again, and they, and they're united, and that's how I kind of got that concept of the soldier. He waits for his wife to grow old, and then he comes back for her. It is a beautiful song. It is a beautiful song, and really told it from a different the stories from a different perspective that you don't hear a lot of. It's it's from that to see soldiers' perspective. So I really liked it, and I'll have the YouTube link to it in the the, the radio post as well. Well, the you first know, time I played it for Pepper, she cried. <laughs> And every time I think about it and I go through it, I, it chokes me up too. 
it had you know that's why I don't I, I I don't sing the song. There's there's a few songs I don't sing that have an emotional attachment and uh, it it just kind of rocks me and it's hard emotionally to get through it. You know, and that's one of them. I probably wouldn't sing that live. I couldn't imagine me singing it live because I don't think I could get through the song. Wow. Wow. You know, John, I meet a lot of veterans who, you know, served their country and maybe they did something before they got in the military. They were, you know, in college for a little while in a trade school or just bounced around, but they sang, had a guitar or whatever, and they they get out and they want to, you know, make a, a living doing this. And a lot of them tell me it's it's very frustrating, very hard. And I was just curious if you had, you know, you say you mentor some of these younger folks. Well, do you have any, you know, advice you could share for the veteran artist who's trying to break into the music scene, you know, post-military service? For any artist or just... Just military. veterans primarily, yeah. Well, you know, as a veteran, you have a a lot of opportunities, you know, because you can go to government, you can get government jobs. I mean, you have you have priority. Uh, yeah, you as a veteran, you have a certain priority in government jobs. You, you can, you know, you'll get almost any job. You could work for the government, you well, work for the police off police force or anything. But well, if I'm you want to talk about the music business, like like you know, so they get out of the military as like a you know machine gunner or you know foreman, and they want to take their they they were playing the guitar during their military service, and now they want to break into the music business. Well, number one, you have to have a really specific goal. Yeah. You know, if you're going to be a, 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 in the music business, you have to know ex exactly what you want. Are you going to be a musician? Uh, are you going to play backup for people? Are you going to just play in bands? You can play cover bands. Um, you know, uh, you can go to school and and learn how to uh, be a music uh, music teacher, uh, or you can be someone like that goes to Nashville and wants to be a singer songwriter. Yeah. Now, you, the more specific you are about what you want, the better chance you're going to have. Now, if you're going to be a singer songwriter, you have to pick the genre that you're going to you want to be in. You know, is it country? Is it pop? And then you have to learn that style of writing, that particular format of writing. Now, I know a lot of artists are very talented, but they don't want to write in that, that structure of radio format. Well, if you don't write in radio format, you can't expect to get on the radio. And if you can't get on the radio, uh, you're not going to get the recognition that you want to be to where you want to succeed. So you really have to be specific. Now, I know what I wanted to do was get on the radio. So I studied radio format songs. I've sung radio format songs, all the different songs I learned how to sing. I, I was familiar with the structure, where the verse was. Uh, your intro is four bars or, or is it eight bars if it's a fast song. Uh, you know, your verse is eight bars, two verses. You have a pre-chorus, a chorus. You have a post-chorus. You have to know all these. I mean, you have to write in this particular format. Then if you write a, a good song, it doesn't have to be a great song, a good song in this structure, you have a good chance that if you're promoting it, you can get on the radio. You can start getting radio play. But if you write a great song that doesn't fit that format, you're not going to get on the radio. So you really have to know your goal and what you want to do. Because if you want radio format, but your radio, but you're writing in a different format structure, of your song, of your music, you're gonna miss. You're gonna miss where you want to go. So it's not that difficult. You just have to know what you want specifically and find somebody that will help you achieve that goal. You know, like Pepper produces all my music. So, and you got to have a producer when you go into a, a recording studio. I know a lot of people have home studios. I have a home studio. It, and to be an engineer it takes years to be a really good engineer um, and I'm an adequate engineer but I don't use it for that I use it to to write my songs and arrangements but when I take those uh, uh, songs we go to uh, Nashville we sit with an arranger called the radio uh, 
uh, what, what do you call him? Uh, session, session leader. Okay. And we sit and we rewrite out the chords and get a, an idea of where the song is going to go uh, so that it, it best suits where we want to go in, in the radio world. And Pepper produces that. You have a good have to have a good producer with good ears. You know, the artist communicates with the producer. The producer communicates with the session leader. Session leader communicates with the musicians. It's a it's structure that that's the way it's done. And when an artist goes in by himself without a producer, you know, it's just too much for an artist to have to think about. The artist is there to do specific thing to be creative and do what his songs require for him to do artistically. But the producer, he takes control of everything else and, and they're handling, you know, whatever you, whatever they're trying to accomplish what you want, but they're trying to make it happen in a, in a way that's gonna get you good results. So there are certain things you have to have in play. If you have these things in play, you're gonna have a really good chance. But you, one thing you gotta do is invest in yourself. You yeah. know, many singer songwriters, I've met and I go, oh God, I've heard your songs. You know, uh, when you do the writers round in Nashville, you know, where did your recording? They go, oh, I've never recorded it. Well, why not? They say, well, because I have no money, I'm broke. Well, that's no excuse. You, you got to record your songs. You got to put money into it, even if it's a demo or something. But if you don't record that, uh, your songs aren't going to get any, heard anywhere. You've had a very long career. I mean, I'm on your site and, you know, getting spun up for this and listen to your music and you've been doing this for a long time is it still fun to do at this stage in your career are you still enjoying getting up there and entertaining audiences and 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 making them happy does that still fuel your drive it is a lot of fun you know and, and i enjoy it uh i enjoy sharing my songs and i'm always surprised sometimes when i'm singing a song i, I think to myself i can't remember can't believe I actually wrote this. You know, it's like, but you know, writing the song and getting it to where it is, there's a lot of steps. There's a lot of people involved. You know, like I said, there's the artist, there's the producer, there's the session leader, there's the musicians, there's the uh, uh, engineers that mix it, the mastering. There's a whole lot of people involved. Yeah. You know, to get where you want to go. But I enjoy it. I enjoy it. But you know, I tell you what, I really enjoy is meeting all the other people. And interacting with all the other people. When you go to Nashville, you do these writer rounds in Nashville, and you get to perform with all the other artists. That camaraderie is really inspiring because you know everybody is so supportive of each other. Now they're all trying to get that recording contract and everything, that, you know, and they they want to beat you out of it. I mean, they're not trying to beat you out of it. They just want it for themselves. But other than that, everybody's very supportive uh, of what you're doing. You know, if, if your song is, uh, you're singing your song, everybody in the audience is supportive. They're listening to you. You know, if people want to co-write with you. It's, it's a really positive atmosphere. You know, but everybody's trying to get that recording contract uh, in, unless you're a successful independent artist. Now, we're an independent artist. We we're not looking for recording contracts. That's not something that we feel we need to do because once you re-sign that piece of paper and you're obligated to a record company, you don't make any more decisions. You yeah. know, we, you can't put a uh, a goat on your uh, on your <laughs> CD cover like we did. We have a goat on our CD cover. We can do whatever we want, how we want to promote our music. We can record any song we want. We have complete control on how we want to produce it. You know, but when you sign that record uh, record agreement, that contract, you lose all that. You don't have any more control. Your ideas uh, and opinions don't matter to them. They have their ideas of how they're going to market you, and you follow what they what they want. They may listen to you. So that's a really nice idea. Keep it to yourself. This is what we're going to do. Wow. So there's a trade-off, you know, because, and then when you sign that, they may give you a hundred thousand dollars, a couple hundred thousand dollars in your pocket, but that's a loan. You have to pay that back. You know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, 
even if they give you a million dollars, oh, we're going to give you a million dollars to sign this recording contract. That's a loan. You know, they're not giving it to you. But that's a loan. And you, they're going to send you on tour and you've got to, and out of that million dollars, you got you have to pay for uh, all the expenses and everything, you know. So there, there's a certain thing, uh, uh, signing a contract that's good because you may, they could get you to become world famous on a different higher level, like Taylor Swift, you know, uh, people like that. But you give up a lot, you know, and and uh, the fame isn't always that exciting when you, you know, it's nice to people recognize you when you're in some places and people go, oh, John, Michael, I love your music, you know, like that. But people don't mob me, you know, but it's nice that they recognize me. But I don't know if I want to be as famous as somebody like Taylor or like that, you know. But uh, it's nice to have that kind of success. But you do lose a lot, a lot of your freedom and uh, spontaneity. This is just like a master class. Like I, 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 I didn't know anything about radio format. I figured some songs didn't get played because of certain things, but had no idea about that. And, and really, your your perspective on what it takes to succeed is very key because I think a lot of not just veteran artists, but artists in general will just try to do everything all at once or think they don't need a producer's help. Um, and Pepper's award-winning, man. I mean, you know, she, yeah. she's she's good at this, better than. Well, you need somebody like that. You yeah. know, you should interview her because you get a whole different perspective on the music industry. I mean, she literally communicates with people all over the world. She has uh, uh, connections, you know, she'll be speaking with somebody in uh, Australia and in Germany or things like that, you know, uh, our songs hit the charts over there. She contacts the people and she says, we want to say thank you very much for, you know, playing our song and, and, and she makes sure that we are in communication with them and we appreciate it. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of work that, uh, that goes on to it from the time she gets up in the morning after she feeds the animals I mean, she's doing work. She's communicating with people. She's sending out stuff. She's promoting it. She is the record company, you know. Uh, and uh, as an artist, it's hard for an artist to do all that work. Uh, it's amazing the things that she gets done. And then my obligation is when she says, I need this type of song and I need this at this particular time, uh, I have to come up with that. She says, you have a radio show, you have to be prepared. You know, the more successful that you become, the more people re, uh, rely on you, the more responsible you have to be. And that's a big uh, awakening for many people, for artists. You know, the more successful you are, the more responsible you have to be because other people depend on you and they they need you to, to own up to it, you know. What's next for you and Pepper for your music in 2024 and 2025, John? Well, we're leaving for Nashville next week. We're okay. going on a, a Smoky Mountain tour. It's called the Smoky Mountain tour. People could go to uh, uh, johnmichaelferrari.com. And I think uh, there's a tour of all the places that we're going to be performing. Uh, we're also recording uh, some new songs in Nashville. We're taking two of our uh, kids, our students, uh, to Nashville with us. Uh, one of them, is Sophie Love, she's recording her third song. She's recording her third song in Nashville. And she's also uh, be getting an award at the Las Vegas Music Awards uh, in March. She's getting her first award. Uh, exciting for her. See, now we've taken her and we peppers guided her with her career and within how long we since nashville uh, uh we took sophie been a year well since within that year i mean she's accomplished a lot but she's accomplished a lot because pepper knows how to navigate and and where we're taking her so we're taking her again uh she, which she's touring with me and singing her songs and she also sings backup for me and we're taking a new student uh, who's written a very good Christmas song. And she's going to record it for her first time. This is her first time going to Nashville. Uh, and she's going to be in the studio. And it's, it's, her and her mother are flying in with us. 
and we're, Pepper's guiding her and helping her navigate uh, to where you know she can have some success. And hopefully her Christmas song will do well enough and pay for her college education. <laughs> you know? Nice. I'm on your website now looking at young people tunes and you've got a whole like youth movement going on, John. It's really cool. Well, you know, if you can find a mentor, uh, somebody who's doing what you're doing and successful at it, you will save years of painful mistakes. You got to listen to what they're saying and you may feel like you, well, I don't want to do that. Well, you don't want to do that. You, then you're going to spend those years making mistakes. But if you have a mentor and you listen to your mentor and take their advice, you, you know, you're going to get where you want to go a lot faster because it's all about making good choices and good decisions. Yeah. You know, and working on your craft. Uh, I work with Sophie. We work every day. We rehearse every day for our shows and uh, I, re I sing all the time and, and practice every day for those performances. And we've been practicing earlier today for our uh, tour that's coming up next, starting next week. You know, getting ready for that. Yeah, I see that. I click on the tour link in your website and literally um, the starts like next week. And then, you know, your show, our show is going to drop March 20th between uh, your 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 uh eight, 18th and uh 26th show so you're 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 oscar mike man you're moving around yeah yeah you know she makes that happen you know and uh because it's funny because a lot of other artists you know come to her and say will you manage me and pepper says i i got a lot just to have, have managing john <laughs> that's a lot of work just managing one person oh, i'm you sure know. i'm sure well i i have learned a lot and, you know, this just, you know, you have your perspective from you know, your, your childhood, you know, serving in Vietnam and, and, you know, seeing that up close and personal. And then the soldier's prayer, which, you know, I, it really touched me as someone who I didn't serve in Vietnam, John, but I, I lost uh, fellow Marines during my time in, even though we didn't serve in combat. But it really, you know, communicated to me, it really touched me in a way that um, I'm sure you can understand. So. Um, I've just learned a lot, had a blast talking with you. And uh, if I get down to Nashville and, you know, I'd like to definitely come see you live. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, it's a, uh, I'm very fortunate. I have a good support group uh, and you need that in this business. And, you know, you, there's times you, you're going to have uh, hard knocks, you know, along the way. And if you have your family and support group, they'll help you along. You know, uh, I lost my mother, a uh, few uh, some time ago uh, but my sister ever since I was a very little kid she's always looked out after me and whenever I needed help I call my sister and need help and she was always there for me and she's been my support and uh, thank God for her and for Pepper and and you know there's always a lot of people involved in a career that help you and you know you just appreciate that a lot absolutely absolutely well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm with John Michael Ferrari, uh, you know, U.S. Army veteran, Vietnam veteran, and, you know, successful recording artist. John, I just want to thank you for, you know, sharing with me. Really appreciate Core PR for setting this up. And Pepper, uh, you know, the, the set is on point. I love it. And I love the cats, too. I think that's really cool. And um, hope to meet you in person someday, John, and hear you perform. Where are you from? Are you uh, Where do you live at? I'm currently in the Boston area. Oh, Boston. Okay. Yeah, but I get down to Nashville, you know, once a year if I can. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll well, check keep in. in touch with us. Let us know where you what you're doing. Absolutely. We look out here in Nevada. If you ever come to Nevada, let us know. We have an extra spare room here. Well, that'd be really <laughs> cool. I mean, I've been to Nevada a couple times uh, when I was in Yuma, and we would ride up from Yuma to Nevada. That was very cool, and uh, I, I love it. I love it. So, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us on the show. Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very interesting story. If you're, a, even if you're not a veteran, if you want to learn about the music business of succeeding, you've got a really like masterclass right here. Uh, Mr. Ferrari, John, I appreciate you. And Pepper, you, you did, you're doing great. I uh, can't wait to meet you in person. And we will see you next time for Mission right. Flight. Thank you. Thank you.
remember, on and teach is our mission. We care about it, we do it every day. But I think there are things that just hit you and give you a reason to go on. The theme for our 2024 for Reads Across America is Live With Purpose. It just seemed to fit in with the vows of the wreath, the 10 attributes that we feel represent our United States military. And I thought, what a great opportunity to put those two things together and show our kids through how we act some of the things that can make their lives better, their communities better, and by doing that, the country better. For me, live with purpose, I think, is a, it's a mindset. Set some guidelines and then go out and purposefully make life different, make a change. It's an opportunity to set an example. Thank you for listening and watching Oscar Mike Radio, where our active duty service members and veterans are in action and the mission is in flight. Oscar Mike Radio is an oversized load, co Sinister One production. If you are a veteran or know a veteran who needs help, please dial 988 and press 1 for the Veterans Crisis Line.